Hey, good morning, everyone. How you doing? Look at this. is not bad. This isn't bad for daylight savings. Look at you guys. You did well, right? I thought, thought we might see a shift in the, uh, in the schedule today, um, but you guys did well, right? One hour less of sleep. I asked a farmer to defend daylight savings today, and they made me look bad, so uh, we'll just keep doing it. We're in a series called Light the Dark. Uh, We're in this 10-week series of the Gospel of John. As we go through, we look at the words and the life and the actions of Jesus. Uh, And we are in the fourth week of that 10-week series. And we're up to John chapter 5. Now, last week we were in John chapter 3. This week we're in John chapter 5. So we did skip over John chapter 4, which is uh, a lot of that is the woman at the well, which is a great account. Now, if you're interested in that and you missed it, I did just talk about that in... Uh, woven. It's a message called Uniquely Positioned. So if you're just longing for some John 4, you can go back to January 13th and watch that because today we're going to go to John 5 and we're going to talk about healing. I want to talk to you about the hope of healing. Now healing is a very interesting thing. I was thinking about this this week. Friday was my eighth anniversary of my first day at Northgate, which to me sounds crazy because I still think I'm in the honeymoon period. Um, I'm starting to think you guys are really this nice. I'm going to let my guard down. But like somewhere in my mind, I'm thinking, well, it's just because I just got here. That's why they're still being so nice to my family and I. Um, But I've been here eight years. And so I was thinking back because when I first started, uh, there was a, a young boy who had a pretty serious illness. And I remember this because early on I was here and I felt God saying, I want you to pray for him to be healed. And I was like, okay, God, that's a little out of my comfort zone, but you know, if we can do that. So I started to pray regularly, right? Pray every day for this kid to be healed. And if I thought of him through the day, I would pray for him to be healed and say, God, you know, please heal him of this. And eventually God said, no, 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 that's not, that's not what I'm asking you to do, right? I think you know that, and this is not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to pray for him to be healed. And so I want you to put hands on this boy and to pray. And I was like, oh, okay, God, I'm not sure about that. Like, if I do that, it's like maybe it's going to give his mom false hope of something, you know, and I don't know and can't make any promises. So I went and got a prayer card that his mom had written, and I knelt down right there, and I put my hand on the prayer card, and I started to pray that God would heal this boy. And as soon as I was doing it, God was like, not that. Like, you know, that's not what I'm asking you to do. And it became like this constant thing for a while with God and I. Anytime I tried to pray or to read my Bible or to preach, like all God is saying is, I've given you this thing to do and you haven't done it. So finally, reluctantly, I contacted his mom and I told her the whole story. I said, this is what's been happening. I don't know. I don't get it. I'm not sure. You know, I don't want to give you this false hope. I just know that God has told me very clearly I need to put my hands on his shoulders and pray that he will heal him. And so she came in the next Sunday early for church, and we met in my office. We talked for a little bit, and we t- you know, talked to the boy and talked to his mom. And finally, I did that. I put my hands on his shoulders, and I prayed as boldly and as powerfully in the name of Jesus as I know to pray. And he wasn't healed. He wasn't healed, and I was worried about that because the Bible says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, and that's part of the reason I didn't want to do it is I thought, well, what if I pray and it doesn't happen? then what's the implication there? Well, that I'm not a righteous person, right? Because that's what it says. And healing is a tricky thing. It's a complicated thing. On the other hand, I remember going to visit a man uh, at my last church where I was a pastor. And he had this this emergency situation. He was having some problems with his brain, some issues, some abnormalities. And they looked at the scans and they said, we got to get in there right away. And so I went to the hospital to visit him the night before had a great conversation with him, and I prayed, and I prayed that the doctors would be wise and that the the surgeon's hands would be steady and that he would heal well and God would give his wife peace and all those things that we pray. I did never pray that God would heal him. That night I was having dinner at Tully's in Batavia, and I got a phone call from this guy, and I walked outside to answer it so I could hear him, and he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, the doctor just came back in. He said, we looked at your scans from earlier. We looked at your scans from right now, and there's nothing wrong anymore. He's like, we're, we made sure. We thought maybe we had the wrong scans. They're like, we've double checked, we've triple checked. He said, everything is fine. I don't need to have surgery tomorrow. I said, I'm, I'm packing up. I'm on my way home. My doctor said he's going to go golfing tomorrow. And I had never, of the things I prayed, I never prayed, God, would you heal him without this surgery, right? Can you just, we know, God, you can lay your hand on him and make him well now. I never prayed that. And because of those kind of situations and others like that, because at times we know somebody that we have prayed for God to heal, we've desperately asked, and we haven't seen it, that we don't always have hope for healing. We don't always boldly ask God to do what only he can do. 
Now, I've got to tell you, I'm always hesitant uh, when somebody says that we can bottle up the, God's power of healing and they can distribute it in any way they see fit. Right? Healing is a spiritual gift. We'll talk about that. It's listed there. Um, but I'm weary of anyone that will tell you like, well, yes, I am a healer, right? And I can teach you how to become a healer. I'm always weary of those things. Now, this passage that we're going to look at today in John 5, is going to show us a time when Jesus chose to heal someone. And interestingly, he chose to heal someone that really didn't have faith at all. But that teaches us a lesson that the healing power of God is never primarily about us. It is always about him. It always comes back to him. So I can't, I won't, I would not stand up here today and preach a message to you that says anyone who has enough faith will be healed. I've been in those situations. I've heard those messages preached where it says, if you're sick and you're not getting better, it's because you don't have enough faith. And that is toxic and untrue. That would be so insulting to the people here who earnestly pray for God's healing power to show up in their life or in the life of somebody that they love. We have people who regularly, sometimes weekly, put in prayer cards praying for healing, and we join them. We say that every week, but we join them, we take that seriously, we pray for every single card multiple times during the week. And sometimes we see God do incredible things, and other times we don't. So in John 5 today, we're going to see Jesus, uh, this account of Jesus, and a man who was in need of healing. Now this man, as a lot of people were that Jesus uh, you know, met in the, in the Gospels as he encountered, he was in need of both physical healing and spiritual healing, which is one of the great things about Jesus in the Gospels, right? He was your one-stop shop for all your healing needs. Like you have physical needs, you have spiritual needs, you've come to the right place. The man that we see in Mark 2, his friends lower him down through a hole in the roof, right? Because he needs to be healed, he's paralyzed, and they lower him down, and Jesus sees this, and Jesus says to the man on the mat, son, your sins are forgiven, and his friends, I think his friends are like, hey, man, that's cool uh, and everything, and thank, thank you for that. Uh, we actually brought him because he's paralyzed, and we thought you would heal him, and he could walk out of here. But I can, only, I can only go on today and talk about this and dive into this once we have two things firmly in our minds. First, that anyone who isn't being healed is not because they don't have enough faith. We need to make sure we understand that. And the second thing is that anyone who is sick or anyone who is injured or anyone who is going through a physical difficulty is not as a result of their sin or the sins of their parents. And we're actually going to look at John 9 in two weeks and talk about that. So if that intrigues you, come back. And if it doesn't intrigue you, come back because God will use it either way. But today, though, we're going to talk about those two kinds of healing, right? We're going to examine both kinds of healing, healing from physical illnesses, sicknesses, things like that, and also spiritual healing from the sins that will take over our life and that will hold us down. So are we good with that before we go on? Oh, you guys seem great. All right, cool. Well, this, that's all I got. So whether you're good with it or not, we're going to keep going. Let's unpack this. Let's see how we can apply it in our lives today. And we'll start with the main point is that Jesus is our source of hope and healing. Jesus is our source. It all is going to start and end with Jesus, and that's why we do a gospel series every year, because it's all about Jesus, and it's about what Jesus does in our lives. So look at John 5, starting at verse 1. Here's what it says. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there, in Jerusalem, near the sh now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. So take a minute, let's just get this picture in your mind, right, of this pool of water, and don't, don't picture your friend's backyard pool with like a slide and a swimming pool it's, or a, a diving board. It's not like that. It's much more like a pond with these covered pillars around it. And this has become the place uh, for all the people who are disabled. It says the people that are blind, the people that couldn't walk, people that couldn't move at all. This has become the place for them to congregate. And so when you think about it in some ways, like this might be a, it's be a difficult place to be, right? There's a lot of needs here. There's a lot of needs going on as these people all gather there. And most of them, they probably couldn't have gotten there themselves, right? This guy that we're going to hear about who's been a paralytic for 38 years, he was probably left there by someone that loved him, right? They didn't have anything better to do with him. They didn't know what else to do, and so they brought him there. And why, why would people be gathered there? Why would family members or loved ones bring these people and leave them at this pool? Well, the answer simply is hope. 
Look at the next verse, John 5, 4. We find out that from time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. So they were here at this pool because of this faint hope that they might be cured of whatever disease they had, whatever it was that brought them to this place. Now, there's a few things to look at in this verse. John tells us that an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. And so because of that, I don't think we can just completely dismiss this as merely a hopeful legend, right? There's part of me, the skeptical part of me wants to be like, wow, that's crazy, right? But God can do it. So maybe this hope of healing was real. Maybe it really was an angel of the Lord that stirred the waters. And because of that, God honored the faith of the people that were there. But whether or not there was real healing in this pool or it was just a legend, many people believe that this pool was the key to their healing. And for the vast majority of them, following the crowd was going to lead to nothing but disappointment. I mean, the verse tells us that the water was stirred from time to time. I mean, one, how often is from time to time, right? It's not like it's happening maybe every day or every hour. Just as from time to time, it feels like it could be rare. But on top of that, when the water is stirred, only the first person in the pool actually would be cured. So it says there's a great number of people at the pool and only one is healed. It feels like the odds of you being the one here were pretty low. And on top of that, a lot of these people have very serious physical infirmities, obviously. They wouldn't have been there. And so you've got people that can't move well and they're trying to race to get in a pool racing against everybody else. It's a system of disappointment. But that's what we find when we just do what everyone else around us is doing. I already told you that Jesus is our source of hope and healing because on the other hand, following the wrong people may lead us to put our hope for healing in the wrong places. If we follow the wrong people, it might lead us to put our hope in something that it shouldn't be in. Make sure if you are going to follow everyone else around you that you are around the right group of people. Right? If you want to do that, you get engaged in a small group, you get engaged in a prayer, prayer group, uh, you get around people that are going to lead you in the right way. And I'm not going to try and rip our guy here, right? He, he doesn't have a name. Um, he's just called an invalid, which doesn't feel very politically correct at this point. And also, it goes against everything that Patch Adams tried to teach us, right? So, I mean, I, I almost feel like we should give him a name, um, just so we can keep going. So, Joe, John? Okay, well, that's my name. I was going to do Joe, but we can go with that because I can remember that. So I'm not trying to rip on him, right? Because it's likely he didn't have any place better to go that gave him any more hope of healing than this. But as this interaction progresses, we're going to see clearly that he is putting his hope in the wrong places. So look at John 5, 5 and 6. The next verses tell us, One who was there had been an invalid, that's John, for 38 years. Well, see, but the book is John, so that's confusing. We're going with Joe. When Jesus saw Joe lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now, first, there's a great number of people here. We've already heard that, and Jesus spots this one guy in the crowd. It doesn't say he had interactions with anyone else. It doesn't say he healed anyone else. That's not in the text. No, presumably, he just locks in on this one guy, this guy who is particularly hopeless, and he finds out his story. Now, keep in mind, Jesus knew his story, right? Jesus didn't need him to tell the story, so we know that is all for the benefit of the listeners that are there and for us. But this guy has been there for a lifetime. This is 38 years. Now, for me, I am 38 years old, so that feels like a particular lifetime sentence to be there. And something about him and his story really seems to resonate with Jesus. And I want you to know that Jesus sees our pain and our brokenness. Jesus sees our pain and our brokenness. If you are struggling this morning, if you are struggling with sickness, if you're struggling with pain, if you're struggling with something else that you would like to be healed from and you have not been healed, please know that Jesus sees you. The Bible tells us that God is close to the brokenhearted, just as Jesus was close in proximity to Joe this day. You might feel like no one else in the world knows how you are feeling. No one else knows how you're struggling. No one else knows the pain and the brokenness of your situation. Certainly that is how this man felt that day. But I want you to know that Jesus sees you and that he promises to be with you whether you are healed or not. 
And once he sees this man, Jesus asks him a question that I think is really, really interesting, maybe the most interesting part of this passage. He says, do you want to get well? And on the surface, I think we read that and we think, what kind of question is that, Jesus? You've got a guy that's been in this hopeless situation. He has no way out of it. And you're asking him, do you want to be well? Who on earth would not want to get well? But I think wanting to be well is a critical step in our healing. Wanting to be well is a critical step in our healing. I had a doctor's appointment this week. I only go to doctor's appointments when they're like new doctor. Like I get a new doctor and I have to go in and meet them. I'm like, other than that, I would stay out of the system. Um, But we're going in and we're talking and we start talking about a knee injury I had in 2016 that never really got better and I did x-rays and MRIs and physical therapy and all that stuff and it just never got back to the point where I could run like I did before that injury. And we're talking about it and she asked me this question. She says, well, do do you want it to get better? I was like, of course I want it to get better. What kind of question is that? She's like, well, I mean, it's going to take a lot of work. Like, we can do it, but you're going to have to do more x-rays and MRIs. You might have to do, you have some surgery. You might have to do physical therapy and go to a runner's clinic. But she said, do you want it to get better? And I was thinking about this guy because there's some interesting implications. One, I think Jesus wants to know if he's working with someone who will be invested in their own healing. Right? And that's what my doctor is asking me. She doesn't have a magic wand that she can wave and make my knee better. She's going to need me to be involved in that. But Jesus is saying, I could just touch you and heal you, but I want to know, do you want to be well? Will you be involved in this? And we're going to see Jesus give him a commandment that I think tests that in a little bit. Two, another implication is that this is the life he's known. This life, although it's not a good life, it's not an easy one. It is a familiar life to him. And far too often, we will default and choose what is familiar over the better thing that God is offering. I think Jesus is asking this. He's inquiring about this. And then the third implication to me here, it ties more uh, to the issue of being healed of our sins, right? To being healed from our sins. And maybe that's part of the underlying question Jesus is asking. Because we are really good at praying for the forgiveness of our sins right? God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me, right? We're, in our mind, we're saying, please help me to avoid the consequences of this sin. Um, and we might even say, God, help me not to do it again, right? God, help me not to sin again. But I think the question here from Jesus, it stands to each one of us, do you want to get well? Do you want to get over your problem with alcohol so much that you're willing to give up some friends? Do you want to stop looking at pornography enough that you'll get rid of a smartphone and you'll go back to a flip phone? Right? Or that you will get rid of the cable and internet in your house? Do you want to save your marriage enough that you will walk away from your job and find something else? Because Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. Or if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And while that is not meant literally, I think if we don't take it literally enough to say, if something in front of your eyes causes you to sin, get rid of it. If something in your hand causes you to sin, get rid of it. If we don't take it that literally, I think we're not taking the gospel seriously enough. I think when we find ourselves stuck in the consequences of our sinful choices and we turn to Jesus, time and time again, he asks us the same question. Do you want to get well? I visited people in jail that were there because of their addictions. And I've sat with people who were ticked about getting arrested and facing the tough consequences of their choices. And then I've sat with people who were absolutely done with that lifestyle and who knew when they were getting out that they were going to do whatever it took to get and stay sober. People that would go to five, six, seven meetings a day so that they could stay clean. I've sat in rooms with struggling married couples. I've seen couples that are sick and tired of fighting and not being happy, but at the same time, largely unwilling to change anything about themselves to make it better. And then I've sat with couples who are broken and who are saying, I will do whatever it takes to become the husband or wife that my marriage needs to be strong. I've talked to many people who are incredibly frustrated with their finances and they don't know where to turn. And I've offered them the chance to take Financial Peace University and to learn how to live on as little as you can so you can pay off all your debt and after several very hard years, be free and have peace. And they weren't willing to do that. They didn't really want to be well that much. And so my friends, let me ask you, do you want to be well? Do you want to be well? This issue that you've struggled with, what you've wrestled with, what you've asked God to take away, do you want to be well badly enough that you are willing to do whatever it takes, to do whatever God asks you to do to get well and to be free?
And some of you might not be. You're not there yet. And if you don't, if you aren't willing to do that, probably much like Joe here in the story, you probably have some excuses. Because he seems to take this question from Jesus as a bit of an insult, which I get. Jesus is asking him if he really wants to get well, and that leads him to give the excuses of why that hasn't happened yet. Look at verse 7. This is his response to do you want to get well. He said, sir, Joe replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And he says, you know, man, it's not that I don't want to get well. It's just that I have no real chance of getting well in this situation that I find myself in. He says, other people, they have it better than me, right? They have someone to help them in the water. They have a better support system. Other people, they're faster, right? They're not as sick as I am. They don't have the problems that I have. Their injuries, their illnesses aren't as serious. And he put all of his hope in this one particular kind of healing, that this was it. It was going to be this or nothing. And that left him feeling absolutely hopeless. Because when we put our hope in something other than Jesus, healing feels distant. When we put our hope in that, when we look at this system or we look at what's going on, we feel distant. We feel a long way from healing. This man has no idea who Jesus is, as we're going to see in a little bit, to the point that he is having a conversation with the one person who can actually heal him, and he seems to be thinking, hey, maybe this guy would help me get into the water, right? He had no idea that Jesus doesn't need that water to heal him. Jesus doesn't need that. He has no idea that the hope he's suddenly feeling isn't because he might get in the pool first. It's because he's encountered the source of all hope. Healing felt so distant to this man because he had misplaced his hope. And so Jesus, he surprises our guy and he surprises anyone that's listening by giving him a command. Jesus gives him a command that on the surface was impossible for him to carry out until he actually tried it. Look at verses eight in the first half of nine. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once this man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Jesus speaks, this man obeys, and suddenly the paralysis that has defined his life for 38 years is a part of his past. Because when Jesus speaks and we obey, things change. When Jesus speaks and we obey, things change. That's why we need to be people that radically follow the words of Jesus, not half-heartedly, not in a safe way, right? Not in a, okay, God, I'll pray for their prayer card kind of way, but people that do exactly what Jesus tells us to. We have to take Jesus at his word. He is what we have. He is our source of hope and healing. And I wanna cover this in a, for a little bit. Healing can come in many different ways. I think it's important that we cover that, that we acknowledge that. And I was working on this and I found something by David Jizik in the Enduring Word Bible Commentary. I um, mean, he did a great job breaking it down. So rather than reinventing the wheel, I'm gonna share with you what he wrote about these different kinds of healing. First one is that the elders of the church may anoint someone with oil and pray for them, and they may be healed. And with each of these, you'll see an example, a a reference for that where you can find it if you want to look it up later. James tells the people of the church to go to the elders and to do this. And we've done this. As the elders of your church, we have done this. I'm telling you, we've been in some incredibly powerful moments as we do this, as we anoint someone and we pray for them. But there's nothing supernatural about us, right? None of us have the ability to bottle up God's power. There's nothing supernatural about the oil. The power is in the God that we are praying to and in the way we are being obedient to his word. And we would be honored to do that for you as well. I don't want to just gloss over that. We will pray for you in that way, as the Bible says. We see in Mark 16 that God's people can lay hands on each other in prayer, ask God for healing, and people may be healed. Like I told you, there's nothing supernatural about us. You, the people of God, can lay your hands on someone and can pray for God's healing. The Mark 16 passage are the direct words of Jesus telling people who believe and who are saved and are baptized that they can lay their hands on sick people and pray that they are made well. I told you about this one in 1 Corinthians 12. God may grant someone a gift of healing, either that they are directly healed or have the power to bring healing to another. It's on the list of spiritual gifts, as we talked about a little bit ago. Now, again, I'm hesitant when anyone says they can bottle up God's power for themselves, but it is a spiritual gift listed here, the gift of healing, so we would be naive just to ignore that uh, because some people have attempted to abuse or misuse that. Next, God may grant healing in response to the faith of a person who desires to be healed. 
God may grant healing because of someone's faith. There are people like the woman who reached out and grabbed the edge of Jesus' coat because she knew if she could just touch that, that the power of Jesus would heal her. And it says when Jesus saw that kind of faith, he healed her on the spot. And this is real and it's true and we can find it in the Bible, but it can also lead to that harmful, false perception that we talked about earlier, that if we just have enough faith, God definitely will heal us. Because I hope you've noticed with all of these, every one of these things, every one of these descriptions of healing has the word may in there. He may heal us. He may. And he may not. Two more ways. God may grant healing in response to the faith of another on behalf of the person who is healed. Now this one, this one messes with me a bit, right? God may heal someone because of our faith. He could heal someone else because of our faith. And we see biblical examples of this as well. Again, we see the friends that lowered their their friend in through the roof, right? And it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he was healed. And he was healed of his sins and his paralysis, right? When Jesus saw their faith. In Matthew 8, Jesus is amazed at the faith of the centurion. The centurion comes to tell Jesus about his servant who is sick, who's paralyzed and suffering terribly at home. And Jesus rewards the centurion's faith by healing this other person. And then the last one, and this is important that it's on the list, God may heal through medical treatment. You see some evidences of that. This has to be there because these other forms of healing being possible does not mean that we should just ignore everything other than God in search of healing, right? Because God can heal miraculously doesn't mean we just sit at home with our hands folded praying and say, okay, God, do what you can do. Because God can do a lot and a lot of times he will heal through medical treatment. When my youngest daughter, Emerson, she was two and she was bit in the face by a dog and we immediately began praying and we got all of our friends praying that God would heal her. And God did heal her. God healed her through an amazing facial trauma team, right? And through a great plastic surgeon who did incredible work that night in repairing her face. And God heals her and God gets the glory, but it happened through medical treatment. I believe that God may heal you in any of these ways, through any of these ways, but that doesn't mean that I'll stand up here and tell you to ignore what your doctor says and just wait for Jesus to supernaturally do what only he can do. If your doctor diagnoses you with cancer, you should take every step of chemo and radiation and do everything on the treatment plan that is laid out for you. And at the same time, you should pray. And you should get everyone in this church and everyone that knows you and loves you to pray that God heals you. You should do both. And at the exact same time, the same thing is true for depression and anxiety and for any other form of mental illness, not just physical illnesses. Please don't draw a line here where there shouldn't be a line. Because for some reason, a lot of times Christians are all for medical treatment and medication, except when we get to something like anxiety or depression. And then they pull out this big box of faith and they tell the person that's struggling, well, you just gotta have more faith and you'll be all right. We'll say like, oh, you're depressed, you need the joy of the Lord. You gotta stop doing that, please stop doing that. The last thing that someone who is struggling with depression or anxiety needs is for you to heap some Christian guilt on top and say, well, this is just because you're not a good enough Christian. If you get that figured out, everything will be fine. If you're struggling with a mental illness, if you're struggling with depression or anxiety, you should go to your doctor and address that. And you should take all the steps that are put into your treatment plan. And at the same time, you should pray for healing and you should get your church and the people that love you to pray that God heals you. So we have to wrap this account up. Let's go to verses, uh, the second half of nine and 10. Because we've got a little, the Pharisees are going to come rain on this guy's parade here. It says, the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Our friends, the Pharisees, this guy's walking for the first time in 38 years and they see him. They're like, hey, buddy, it's Saturday, all right? It's Saturday, man. And I love his response. Like, this is a great response. Here's what he replies. Well, the man who uh, made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. I love this. He's like, yeah, okay, cool, it's Saturday. But you see, uh, I'd been paralyzed for 38 years, and then this guy healed me, and he told me to pick up my mat and walk. So I was just doing what that guy told me to do because it worked. And so I'm going to do what that guy says because it kind of seems like he knew what he was talking about. 
But the guy, he still doesn't even know that it was Jesus who healed him until later. They run back into each other at the temple in verses 14 and 15. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now, I'm gonna be really honest with you. I wish that this wasn't in here, right? I really thought about cutting it off before this verse because even though I tell you to read this stuff, most of you guys probably weren't gonna go read it, but I didn't want you to go and read it and then find this verse or read it now and be like, what a wimp, he backed out of that verse. But I wish it wasn't here because it's, it's kind of confusing and I think it can lend to the idea if we take it the wrong way that our physical infirmities are just punishment for our sins. But that's not what Jesus is telling him. And I don't think it's nearly as threatening as it, as it sounds when we read it. Jesus is telling him, hey man, you can walk. That's great. That's awesome. But your greatest need wasn't to be healed of your paralysis. Your greatest need was to be healed of the sin in your life. Because what we know for sure is that Jesus may or may not grant us physical healing on earth. But he offers each one of us spiritual healing and wholeness. And that is our greatest need. Make no doubt about it. Will you receive physical healing on earth? Possibly and possibly not. Some people will not be physically healed until they receive their new, healthy, heavenly body that they'll spend eternity in. So if you are a Christ follower in that way, I can guarantee that at some point you will be healed, right? God always heals our physical problems, sometimes here on earth and sometimes in heaven. But even more than that, even more importantly than that, he offers each one of us spiritual healing and wholeness. He offers us freedom from the sins that have made us slaves. He healed that man that day, but he offered him the freedom of his sins, and that matters even more. So the end of the chapter, or the end of what we're going to look at in the chapter today, in verses 16 to 18, here's what it tells us. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making self equal with God. So Jesus, he gets into hot water for healing this man, right? He puts his own life on the line for doing it. Because people may be skeptical of your healing or its source, but don't let that undermine what you know, right? People, when you are healed, they might be skeptical. They might not believe you. They might, you tell them the story, right? Rosalina told us the story of God healing a broken arm this morning. And some people might say, well, okay, you think that, but this is what really happened. I felt like I had been healed from my addiction to alcohol in a moment. I could share with you where I was. I could share with you the conversation, the particular breakthrough in scripture that God gave me. But it was something that I'd been struggling with at that point for the majority of my life. So I think when I talked about it, even Amy was skeptical to say like, yeah, okay, but let's see, right? Because people are skeptical about that, but I knew. I knew, I knew that something was different and I knew that I had been healed of that. And all these years later, I think other people may have started to believe, even if they were skeptical. Because what we find out is that Jesus is our source of hope, and he is our source of healing. Let's pray. Father God, for the people here, Lord, that are in need of physical healing, Lord, I pray that you would give them continual hope. Lord, we know even in saying that, Lord, that everyone will not be healed. Lord, we know that you could. God, you could put your hand on this church and heal every single one of us of the pains and the sickness and the affliction that we have today. And God, if you want to do that, Lord, we will give you all the, the glory and honor. But God, if you don't, Lord, we pray that we will continue to find our hope in you. Lord, that we will draw close to you, that we will seek you, Lord, that we will do what you say. And God, I pray that even though we may not see physical healing, God, that we will draw to you for our spiritual healing. God, that you will set us free from the sins that will take over our lives if we let them. God, that you offer us the opportunity to be well, to get well and to stay well, and to be righteous in your sight because of your son. So God, help us to walk closely with Jesus, Lord. Help us to seek him, Lord, and to find him and his faithfulness. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.